An avid cyclist dreams of turning his passion into a business. He consults his banker to help find the best path. Now bike wheels are being built, and all it took was a little push to get rolling. First Horizon Bank. Let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Clint. Today's show is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Protect your online activity today and find out how you can get three months free at tryexpressvpn.com slash space. That's tryexpressvpn.com slash space for three months free with a one-year package. Visit tryexpressvpn.com slash space to learn more. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9... Ignition sequence start. Space nuts. Five, four, three, two. One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello once again and thank you for joining us on Space Nuts, a podcast dedicated to the stars. Not of Hollywood, but of heaven and, well, earth too, because we look at them from here. Uh, and joining me is my partner in crime, one Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. <laughs> Good morning, Andrew. How are you? Oh, sorry. We, well, this is a, a, a non-time specific uh, event, isn't it? it so, good be. day, Andrew. How are you? <laughs> yeah, hello works. <laughs> hello. Yeah, actually, all right. Okay. Let's uh, let's rewind that. Rewind, folks. Hello, Andrew. Nice to talk to you again. You too, Fred, as always. Uh, and today we've got some really interesting topics, a couple that have been sent in by uh, uh, listeners of Space Nuts. Uh, we'll get to those shortly, um, but uh, we're going to look at uh, the situation with a galactic superstorm. This is a storm that rages in the centre of our galaxy. But what's really fascinating about this is we have an Earth-sized telescope now that might just give us our first actual glimpse of a black hole. Uh, we talked about that not so long ago and how we know they exist, but we've never seen one, and that prompted a lot of questions. Well, now we might be able to. And uh, another interesting story about our galaxy, because it hit a sausage. <laughs> not recently, not recently, but we'll, we'll, we'll explain all. And, and we've been sent this amazing video uh, of uh, something streaking across the sky, uh, which has got over 3 million hits on Facebook. Uh, we are going to try and explain what that was. And the chestnut that we've uh, discussed a few times over the years, Fred, and it's back again, uh, a direct question about the, um, the division between spending money on astronomy and or poverty. Which way do you lean? That's a tough one. We'll get to that. But uh, first of all, Fred, um, this, this galactic superstorm at the centre of our galaxy that we hope to be able to look at through an Earth-sized telescope, this sounds rather extraordinary. Um, it is, actually. And in fact, the looking has already been done. Oh. Um, what, what's happening now is that um, the scientists who've done all that are working on the data to actually um, bring this clutch of radio telescopes, which is what they are, spread all over the Earth uh, into uh, to the signals from them to bring them into a kind of coherent picture of what their target is. And that's the superstorm, exactly as you've said. So um, backtracking a little bit, we um, know that at the center of our galaxy, and our galaxy, of course, this disk-like uh, aggregation of hundreds of billions of stars, which we sort of see in cross-section as the Milky Way, um, towards the constellation of Sagittarius, that is where the center of the galaxy is. And astronomers have known for 30 years that uh, there is a very bright radio source in the center of the galaxy. It rejoices in the name of Sagittarius A star, uh, and that's why it's uh, what it's, no it's been known as ever since I've been an astronomer. <laughs> it's um, A star. Yeah, well, A star, yeah. It's a capital A and an asterisk, actually, but it's usually called Sag Sagittarius A star. <laughs> and I think that distinguishes it from something else that was called Sagittarius A, uh, which isn't the centre of the galaxy. Right. So uh, Sagittarius A star, a very bright radio source. We've looked in that direction with telescopes over many decades, including with infrared telescopes, which penetrate the dust between ourselves and the galactic centre and allow us to see stars orbiting around what looks like nothing, um, but it, this is in the infrared spectrum, but mm -hmm. what they're actually orbiting around is a black hole. And we can use the way those stars orbit to measure the mass of the black hole. Um, it's of the order of 3.6 million times the mass of the sun. It's a big one. Uh, and it also has a swirling 
um, what we call an accretion disk, a swirling disk of matter, which is the stuff that's being swallowed by the black hole. Now, black holes don't go around, you know, voraciously looking for things to eat. But if stuff gets into their immediate neighborhood, yes, it spirals inwards and is devoured effectively by the black hole. And it's that spiraling um, that causes the, the radio waves and occasionally infrared bursts of radiation uh, and actually x-rays as well. So you get all these different radiations from the, from the disk of material that's being, um, you know, that, that's this maelstrom of stuff that is uh, circulating around the black hole. So the question is, um, that's fine. We, we've got really strong evidence that a black hole is there. It displays all the things we expect a black hole to show. Can we see it? And so a few years ago, a whole bunch of radio astronomers got together and said, if we join up, um, and you can do this with radio telescopes much more easily than you can with uh, visible light telescopes. With a radio telescope, you can kind of join them up together to form an array. Yeah. And so what they suggested was a whole different bunch of telescopes, many of which we've talked about, the, the ALMA telescope in, uh, in the high Atacama, uh, the JCMT, the, um, the James Clark Maxwell telescope, which is in Hawaii. It's one that used to be run from Edinburgh, and I was very much involved with that uh, 100 years ago. Uh, <laughs> and other similar radio telescopes. Um, you can link them all together to basically basically synthesize a telescope the diameter of the Earth. And that gives you the wherewithal to um, see things at very small angular scales. Uh, and by that, I mean, you know, the angle with which you can um, actually spot detail. Uh, the detail they're looking for, and wait for this, this blows my mind. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's round about, well, the diameter of the, 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 the thing that they're looking for is 37 micro arc seconds. So an arc second is one three thousand six hundredth of a degree. In fact, an arc second is the size of a, uh, a you know, a, a, a dime in America or a one dollar coin here in Australia or a pound coin in the UK held up uh, at a distance of five kilometres. Oh, yes, <clears throat> yes, you've told me about that before. That, that, that just is it's un a, unthinkable. It's a, tiny, it's a tiny angle. That's one arc second. Now they're looking for... 37 millionths of an arc second. Oh my goodness! Um, and um, the the basically it's it's a coin on the surface of the moon. That's what you're looking for. So um, yeah, uh, very fine detail, and that's why you need uh, all these telescopes linked together, which incidentally have a name. They oh, have I just read the name, but I'll let you say it. I just love this name. The, I know. Uh, I know. I'm often very. Um, critical about the way astronomers and <laughs> space organizations name things but this is a ripper i think it's a ripper too it's the eht the event horizon telescope actually it could be extremely humongous telescope. <laughs> well we've humongous done that one <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. anyway the event horizon telescope it tells you what they're looking for they're looking for um, this I suppose phenomenon is the word for it, the event horizon. What is the event horizon? It's the part, it, it, it's the, the, let me put it this way, the sphere around a black hole. Mm. Okay. The, the, the interface between a black hole and the and yeah, universe sorry. as we know it. That's right. The sphere around the black hole beyond which you can't see. Yeah. That's, that's the, 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 the definition of the event horizon. So the black hole's at the middle, but around it is this, this sphere of darkness, effectively, and it's dark because nothing can come out of it. Uh, and so, you know, stuff might go into it, but nothing can come out of it. Um, so they, that's the, the this size of a coin on the surface of the moon is the size of the event horizon as seen from our vantage point here, 25,000 light years away from the center of our galaxy where this black hole is. Uh, so what they're doing with the EHT is basically looking at radio signals from the accretion disk, this swirling disk of material uh, going round the event horizon. Um, and they expect to see that, but silhouetted uh, against it will be the event horizon itself. So there should be this 
sort of swirly mass of material with a black blob in the middle. Um, and we also know from simulations that the curvature of space is very, very high near the event horizon. And by that, I mean that, you know, as, as we know, gravity distorts space. Mm. The gravity of the black hole is so extreme that the space around it is distorted in an extreme way. And you can actually see around the back of the event horizon, which is a bit weird. It's because the space is distorted so much. So uh, there are simulations already of what... Sort of, sort of like a fisheye lens to the extreme. That's right, exactly like that. Yeah, it's sort of, you know, a fisheye lens letting you see behind something that's uh, stuck in the way just because space is so heavily distorted so all this is been is being fed into the the models of what the astronomers expect to see and i think the number crunching is going on as we speak i don't know when the details will be released uh, but i hope that it won't be too far away um there are the, the eht just to give you a bit of detail there's nine radio telescopes um they're in chile the us uh france spain mexico and the Antarctic, ah. so all all of the world, and uh, hopefully we might get some information about this soon. I think it's a very exciting thing to look for. It be the first time we've ever seen uh, the event horizon of a black hole, and were. that that will be um, a, a significant moment in astronomy because uh, to, to to date they are a theory because we haven't seen them, and exactly. even though we know they exist, it's just yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's exactly right. It, so it's. Um, you know, this is um, big time stuff. As you say, it's a big milestone. It, uh, um, some people are suggesting that uh, this is one of the big discoveries of the century, just like gravitational waves were. Mm. So, you know, we're making these really huge steps in understanding how to observe the universe in very, very uh, interesting and novel ways. Yep. And the next giant leap, dark energy. Ah, uh, yeah, there you go. Mm. <laughs> All right, watch this space. Boom, boom. Uh, you're listening to Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with Fred Watson. Now, let's take a little break and find out more about our sponsor, ExpressVPN, rated number one by Tech Radar. Uh, this is the one I use. I've been using it for a couple of years and I love it. When I joined ExpressVPN, they were, they were brand new, uh, new to the market, but uh, I read a lot of reviews and did a lot of comparisons. And there was just something about their, their business model that I particularly liked and a couple of years down the track honestly can't complain their interface is very easy to use their their service is second to none uh, I've had to contact them a couple of times about um, certain things that I wanted to do and they were brilliant so you may be wondering why I do need a VPN at all it's all about privacy uh, do you really want big tech companies governments and others knowing uh, what's going on with your online activity. Even if you're having nothing to hide, it just feels downright creepy. Uh, I think you'll agree. And governments are getting more and more interested in what you're doing every day. And so, yeah, protecting your privacy is what VPN is all about. And how often do you uh, run across websites that you want to get information from only to find that they're geo-blocked? This is becoming an increasing problem, but ExpressVPN solves that problem for you. Uh, now, if you go to our special URL, you'll see quite a list of things this service can help you with, things you may never have thought of before. As I say, it's the one I use, secure, fast, and it just works. Uh, so protect yourself online today and find out more about how to get three months free at tryexpressvpn.com slash Space. That's T R Y E X P R E S S V P N dot com slash space for three months free with a one year package. Try expressvpn dot com slash space to learn more, and you'll find the link details in the show notes and on our website. Now, back to the show. Roger, you're live, sir, here also. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, we're going to talk about a collision, a collision that was probably. Um, cataclysmic? No, nah, probably not. Um, our galaxy hit a sausage. This happened. <laughs> this happened about ten million years ago. So nothing to worry about. We're not going to get rained in pork or anything like that. But um, yeah, the, 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 I, I'm guessing that they're describing the shape of something we hit as sausage-like. 
Uh, exactly so, that's right. And this is um, a very nice piece of work that's come from astronomers uh, using data from the European Space Agency's Gaia satellite, the spacecraft that is accurately measuring the positions in the sky of something like a billion stars. Uh, and, um, you know, that's one, well, not this quarter of a percent of the whole galaxy. That's pretty good. Um, the the uh, idea of Gaia is to, as I said, to determine the positions of these stars with accuracy that's kind of not that far different from what we've just been talking about. They're, they're measuring micro arc seconds with Gaia. Um, and, but these are positions. It's not looking at the details of objects on, on that scale. It's the positions of these objects. So they know very, very well that the stars, uh, up to a billion stars, and um, not only that, but because you can see the positions of these stars so accurately, you don't have to wait long for them to have moved, uh, the stars, that I mean. So, uh, you know, the stars we know are swirling around the, the centre of our galaxy. Um, you don't have to uh, wait long, maybe a year or two, with, when you're observing with Gaia to see that they've changed their positions uh, in space. And what that means is you can, you can measure the motion of the stars. In fact, it's only one component of the motion. You and I have talked about this before. Yeah. It's what we call the transverse component. It's the, in fact, the, the technical name is the proper motion. It is the motion of the, of the stars across the line of sight, so the, the motion apparently on the, on the sky. Um, but that's still one component, and you can do a lot with that. Uh, the uh, astronomers who've done this work, actually there are five papers in that very esteemed journal, the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, uh, and another one called Astrophysical Journal Letters, both very, very familiar to astronomers. They're where we publish our, our top-ranked data. Um, so these papers uh, have basically looked at the first analysis of some of the, the, the Gaia data. Um, one of the things that has popped out of this, uh, this comes from astronomers basing, based in Cambridge and elsewhere, uh, is uh, evidence that about 10 billion years ago, which is actually a long time ago because the, uh, our galaxy is only about 12 billion years old, yeah. uh, there was a collision with another smaller galaxy. And we know that this has happened throughout the history of our galaxy. We see the evidence of that from many of these large-scale surveys, including the one I was project scientist for back in the early 2000s, the RAVE survey. We've seen evidence that our galaxy has gobbled up smaller galaxies. And how do we see that evidence? Well, there are all these stars circulating around the, the centre of our galaxy Galaxy, which have similar orbits, the stars themselves uh, are the, basically the remnants of this gal the galaxy that's been gobbled up, but it has been torn apart. It doesn't just get digested, it just gets ripped apart in a way that you can still see the fossilised motion mm. of the uh, original galaxy. So it's, so it's technically still here? It is, that's right. In a way, it's still here. It's, it's uh, still recognisable by the motions of the stars that were originally part of this external galaxy, but are now part of our galaxy. And that's what this recent work uh, has uh, has demonstrated, that a very large dwarf galaxy, still a dwarf galaxy, but very large, uh, 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 collided with our galaxy about 10 billion years ago. And because of its, its shape, it must have had a particular size and shape. <clears throat> um, it, uh, it actually is being called by these astronomers the sausage uh, because it is sausage shaped. I'm, uh, I'm looking at a um, photo representation from uh, an article about this and they've gone with space doogie. <laughs> yeah, they have to. Uh, it's not actually, I don't find that the most appealing sausage, I have to say. No, it's, sure um, it. <laughs> that's assuming it is a sausage, and if it's not, somebody really needs to think about their diet. <laughs> that's right. Anyway, yes, um, a, a sausage is certainly depicted on the article that, <laughs> that Andrew is looking at. There isn't actually a depiction of the sausage uh, at least not one that looks like a sausage in the journals, the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. That's a relief. They drew the line at that, that's right. But it, it was sausage-shaped, and um, it, it actually must have been quite big because the stars that made it, uh, as, the, as the astronomers who did this work point out, they're moving in radial orbits. So what that means is that, you know, if you think of our galaxy... Uh, we think of the disk of the galaxy with stars swirling around the disk. It also has a halo, and the halo is a much more 
rarefied, uh, and by that I mean empty, uh, region around the galaxy. It's kind of spherical, but there are stars in orbit there. We call them the halo stars. They are very ancient stars usually, and they're where you look. It's these stars where you look to find uh, the remnant debris from uh, galaxies that have been eaten up by our own. And so um, what the astronomers are pointing out is that in the halo, there are all these stars whose orbits are not <clears throat> not circular, but almost like a straight line going backwards and forwards through the center hmm. of our galaxy. And that's what will be called a radial orbit because okay. it's radial, it's along a radius of the galaxy. And there are many, many stars with these radial orbits. And that's um, why they, uh, they, the scientists can uh, estimate that this was a fairly massive dwarf galaxy and that it also had this weird shape of a, of a sausage. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Pork, um, or, I don't know. I prefer pork, I think. I, well, <laughs> I, I, I'm Australian, so beef sausages, thank you very yeah, yeah. much. Yes. Uh, but I, I suppose the, the interesting thing is that this, this is not a one-off. Uh, these, these merging galaxy situations are ongoing. They happen super slowly, and as you and I have discussed before, we are going to see this, well, not you and I personally probably, but uh, this is going to happen again with Andromeda. Yeah, that's right. Only Andromeda is a galaxy that's slightly bigger than our own. So this is no minor dwarf galaxy that no. is going to be accreted. Uh, this is a big one. And yeah, this will be the collision to end all collisions. Uh, it will happen in about three and a half billion years. Put it in your diary, as I always say. Mm. You've, got, you've got to be warned about these things. Stick <clears> it in <throat> your smartphone so that it gives you an alert when it's about to happen. <laughs> the trouble is... We won't really, I mean, our distant descendants, if they last that long, will not really see that much difference. The sky will certainly change because when the merger takes place, the, this, you know, the stars in our galaxy and the stars in, in the Andromeda galaxy will basically pass between one another because there's so much empty space out there. But the sky seen from the Earth will be a much brighter place. It will be There'll be more stars. The collision will also, almost certainly... Uh, trigger star formation. That means that the clouds of gas and dust in our galaxy and in the Andromeda galaxy will collide and that will set off the formation of new stars, some of which will be very massive. So there'll be probably a, a, a whole burst of supernova explosions, very bright ones, which could actually be damaging to life on Earth uh, because of the, um, you know, the, the uh, high energy radiation that comes from supernovae. So it could be a difficult time, even though it's unlikely that our sun will collide with a, an Andromeda star. Um, there might be, you know, the solar system itself might be disturbed by gravitational interactions too. But that's less likely than this this burst of new star formation. Uh, great stuff, and yeah, it's uh, it's in in the stars. It's going to happen. Yeah, uh, and in super slow motion. But uh, <laughs> uh, it yeah. would be would be fascinating to witness. But uh, it'll take yeah. a million a million or so years to unfold. Yeah, probably. we ain't we ain't there yet. So no, we ain't there yet. We'll <coughs> just have, we'll just have to be patient. Uh, you're listening to Space Nuts. Uh, Andrew Dunkley here. Fred Watson there. Zero G and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Lastly, Fred, a double whammy from our uh, listening audience. Uh, we've got a couple of things to cover. One of them is a video that's going absolutely crazy on the internet because somebody filmed something rather extraordinary and uh, I think you think you know what it is. And we, <laughs> we have a, a question about uh, the age-old chestnut astronomy versus poverty. Where should we spend our money? Uh, we'll get to that shortly. Uh, this first one uh, comes from Justin Andrews, who spotted a, a Facebook uh, video post by a fellow named Ma uh, Matt Williams. Matt uh, posted this on the 29th of June, sitting on his balcony. Uh, he thought it was a shooting star, but um, it was some. It lasted too long to be a shooting star. This video lasts four minutes, and even then, the event hadn't finished. Uh, whatever it was was still uh, well above the uh, the Earth at the time. So, uh, Justin says, "Hi there, Dr. Watson. Any chance of an ID on this uh, fireball, as per previous podcast discussion, or maybe space junk? Best witches and apologies for the language in the initial post, because the guy who posted it went, "What the bleep is this?" And that's a, <laughs> it's probably a good question. Um, so over to you. It is. So l let me just describe what this uh, video shows. And as you say, it goes for four minutes. Um, basically, um, there is a bright object in the sky. 
which suddenly develops a tale of um, material coming from it uh, and then kind of moves on and then another tale of material comes uh, which is clearly much bigger than the first one and what happens is that is then distorted into some very very weird shapes mm. whilst the bright spot of the object itself which is now kind of immersed within this strange tale of material heads over uh, to towards the eastern horizon and there's a clue in that because this was uh, filmed at 5 a.m i think uh, somewhere in the usa i'm not sure where it was filmed but it's um, somewhere pretty warm because there are sounds of crickets and things on the soundtrack and it's heading towards the eastern horizon because you can see the dawn uh, the light of the dawn in the sky it's very very good footage i have to say that this well, it looks as though it was filmed with a phone um, you know, a smartphone, uh, but it is brilliant because it shows uh, exactly the details of this really strange phenomenon. Um, it's not a fireball. A fireball comes in at um, 30 kilometers per second at least and uh, vaporizes within a fraction of a second. Uh, yes, it lights up the whole landscape because um, that's uh, what they do. That's why they're called a fireball. Uh, but it's basically a football shaped uh, sized bit of space debris and that's natural space debris coming in at that speed uh, which burns up almost instantaneously and, and causes a very bright uh, sometimes a trail as well an orange or um, or greenish trail the greenish comes from excitation of oxygen in the high atmosphere so it's not that because this thing <clears throat> takes a sedate four minutes or so to go across the sky yeah and um, what <clears throat> what I think it is um, and I, I've been trying to find out the details because these things are all recorded, but I haven't got there yet. Um, I'm pretty sure this is a spacecraft venting something. It's either venting fuel or it's possible that it's venting water. Ah. Um, and uh, because the, um, certainly the International Space Station, they dump water um, uh, basically into space from time to time just to get rid of excess water on the spacecraft. Uh, it's a well-known saying. It's among called astronauts. flushing, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's right. It it's flushing. Well, they say that there is nothing more beautiful in space than a urine dump at door. <laughs> And that's because... Gee, we're really going down the gurgler this, this yeah. week. Space doogies and... Yeah, mm. that's right. Yeah, the, the, that's because the, um, what happens when you, when you vent water or, or fuel, actually, into space, it's effectively the same thing. Uh, what is a liquid under pressure, as soon as it hits the vacuum of space, it freezes uh, and becomes, um, you know, basically frosted, frosted particles, uh, condensed uh, bits of ice. Uh, and so you get this huge cloud of material that's uh, sort of pushed out by spacecraft. So I am pretty sure that what we've seen in this footage is uh, a spacecraft probably venting fuel. My uh, uh, task to find out which one it was, which I only started yesterday afternoon when you sent me the, 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 uh, the note, uh, has, has failed. I, I'm not yet sure which spacecraft that was that was venting, but that I'm pretty sure is what we're seeing here. Um, in particular, the spacecraft itself continues beyond the, uh, towards the horizon, uh, being illuminated by the sun at those high altitudes, because it's clearly much higher than, uh, you know, the, 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 the Earth-based images are being taken. Ah, that's why it's shining, because the sun's lighting it all up. Um, there's a natural phenomenon, just to, to do a quick segue, uh, Andrew, which is also causing quite a lot of interest um, these days, because uh, we're seeing quite a few of them. Things called noctilucent clouds. Yes, uh, which no Hannah saw uh, yeah, from her right. airliner. Recently. Indeed, that's right. Mm. Yeah, night shining clouds. And they are... Um, Basically, they're frosted meteor smoke uh, because the, 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 the debris of meteors, um, which is the kind of smoke left behind, but they, they get condensation on them, which is frozen. Uh, so, so it's a similar sort of thing, basically. They, um, you know, you get these clouds of very uh, almost ethereal looking shapes in the sky. And this is similar to that, but it's, it's human made rather than natural. So what will happen to that stuff? Uh, it just basically, you know, it, it's it's in the atmosphere. It uh, is uh, over time. It just gets distributed evenly throughout the atmosphere and becomes dust. Sometimes some of that stuff falls to earth. There are things called Brownlee particles, which were recorded decades. Oh, sorry, ago. sorry. What are they called? Brownlee. That's oh, the name dear. of a person. Yeah. Brown <laughs> That's are unfortunate. Right. L, L double E, yeah, it is a bit. Brownlee particles are um, a, a space debris which which are found in the bottom of oceans and things of that sort. Mm. 
So well, basically, <laughs> when astronauts pee, we get covered in it. Round pee, yeah. No, it's not. That's this is natural stuff. It's nothing to do with astronauts. Right <laughs> <laughs> Not sure I believe you. Anyway, I, what I'll try and do is get that uh, video posted um, or shared on, on the Space Nuts Facebook page so people can take a look at it if they'd like to. Uh, but I'll give you a language warning right now. The, the yeah. fellow was astonished to see this because he said, I only ever see this beep on Facebook, on social yeah. media. Then they're going to see it for real. But um, I hope I did the accent okay. But, uh, yeah, we'll see if we can get that on uh, on our Facebook page for you to have a look at. Now let's uh, move on, Fred, to the very next question. And this comes from, uh, oh, I think it comes from Matt as well, does it? Um, no, different Matt. This is from Matt Jones. Hey, guys, I only just discovered your podcast this week. Sorry about that. And I've been loving it. I've spent every moment in the car this week binge listening to all your episodes. I was wrapped about it being an Australian uh, event, uh, an Australian podcast too, as I'm based in Adelaide. Sorry about that too. Uh, I, do, <laughs> I do have a question uh, for you guys. I'm both a space nut and an anti-poverty activist. And I find these often conflict. I'm passionate about discovering our universe, physics and human spaceflight. So much so I even burnt out a CPU with a SETI, uh, uh, with SETI at home once. <laughs> that's, that's really working hard. My partner's buying me a telescope for Christmas as well. Uh, as we all know, when it comes to space exploration and especially human spaceflight, nothing is cheap and sizable investment of public, public money is needed. Now, this is where the conflict happens. I would love to hear um, that our federal government is making a space flight program, uh, a human space flight program in our new space agency, but this would take a massive pile of money out of our budget that could be used for Australians in need. I'm struggling to justify supporting huge investment of public money in these ventures when I know it could be put into programs such as public housing. I work with people in poverty all the time and I know these resources are very much needed. I do too, Matt. Uh, in my day job, I work for the Salvation Army, so I know where you're coming from. So I was wondering if you guys could uh, uh, put to rest this conflict. Over to you, Fred. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. Look, and I'm going to preface it by uh, by telling Matt that I actually really like Adelaide. So <laughs> forget, forget Dunkley's comments there. Um, but uh, um, it's a question that uh, actually I too wrestled with when I was a university student. I really had problems with this. Uh, how, you know, how do you, how do you justify, because I was studying astronomy, how do you justify studying something that apparently is useless uh, when you really perhaps, um, you know, see a, a world surrounded, surrounding us that has all kinds of problems, which include things like poverty. And the, the answer is, um, I, I think, one that uh, there's got a couple of aspects to it. Um, one is, first of all, why do we do this stuff? Why do we do things like astronomy and exploring the planets so that the NASA programs and things of that sort? Um, first of all, I guess it's driven by curiosity. Uh, certainly in, in uh, astronomy, we, we want to know uh, about things. Um, that has some benefits. One is that it inspires uh, upcoming generations to look at science, uh, it inspires people, nothing inspires people so much as space. Uh, it makes them think about the universe, the way the world is, and, and perhaps, uh, you know, leads to them becoming doctors or, or, uh, or other, other people who've, whose benefit to humankind is immediate. So that the educational aspect is one. There are spin-offs that come from these ventures. Um, astronomy puts pressures on technology that are quite different from any other kind of activity. And that has led to all sorts of really interesting developments, including the, the sensors in your smartphone that take the pictures, all of that, which of course is a benefit to us, actually comes about because uh, nerdy astronomers uh, 30 years ago wanted to get the very best out of their, their own detectors. Um, and and, and there, you know, there are other spin-offs as well. Wi-Fi is one that's commonly uh, commonly mentioned. So that's that. Uh, there are really good reasons for doing that, and, and maybe maybe one day astronomy will uh, actually discover the killer asteroid before it wipes us all out. And that's where I was going to go next, because yeah, uh, right. being able to develop our capacity to see what's going on out there might actually save the human race. Indeed, that's correct. That is absolutely right. So, but okay. So here you are. You've got a, a pot of money. 
um, you've got uh, the possibility of sending a spacecraft to Mars, or you've got uh, people around you who are poverty stricken and whose social circumstances are very, very bad indeed, very hard indeed. What do you do? Well, if it was a straight choice, there is no question. You feed the poor. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it, it's the it's the poverty that takes the, you know, the, 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 the first the first tranche of money. But the bottom line is it, it's not a straight choice like that. Um, governments distribute money in many different ways. And what, what they're doing really by putting money and, and it's small amounts, as I'll explain in a moment, what they're doing by putting money into astronomy and spaceflight is they're kind of investing in the future. They're looking to develop technologies that really have no obvious um, benefit at the moment, but who knows what they might lead to. And that's certainly true. You know, things that were happening in physics 100 years ago, we use every day now in our smartphone. Well, uh, it, coincidentally, today is um, uh, Tesla's birthday. Oh, there you go. Uh, 1859 or something like that. <laughs> See um, that one. The day yeah. we're recording this podcast. Look at the technology today because of what he was doing nearly 200 years ago. Yeah, and, and uh, without really thinking of any, any kind of practical benefit. True, but, but, but yeah, here the, we the, are. The, that, that's right. So, so it, it is never a straight choice. If it was, poverty would win out every time. Um, one, just one final comment on this is that, um, you, you know, the money that's spent on these missions is relatively modest. It looks like a lot because there's often a billion after it that in terms of dollars, certainly as far as the space probe's concerned, you know, something going to Mars will be of order a billion dollars uh, to, to investigate the surface of Mars. And that's a huge amount of money. But when you put it in the grand scheme of things, it's relatively modest. Um, so um, a $1 billion spacecraft uh, going to Mars, uh, that the price tag for that would keep the US military going for roughly 12 hours. Yes. That's that's the contrast. It's staggering, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's um you know, so so it's um it, it's 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 a lot of money, but it's still relatively modest when you look at the, you know, the overall budgets. Um so I kind of rationalized all that. Um, I feel a lot more comfortable with being an astronomer now than I thought I would be when I was 21 years old and studying astronomy uh, in Scotland, because I did, as I said, I did wrestle with all this. But the answer is pretty clear. Um, mm. uh, it's worth doing. It is well worth doing. Yes, indeed. And most importantly, Matt, uh, we'll see when the aliens are coming to get us. That's, <laughs> that's why we're doing it. But uh, no, it's a good answer to a, a pretty tough question. Thank you, Fred. And thank you, Matt. And uh, thank you to uh, Justin for uh, sending in the, uh, the video, which we'll try and share as well. Um, that's it for it. We're done for another week. Uh, always good to, uh, to chat. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we managed to sort out a few more questions. <laughs> Great pleasure, Andrew. Always good to talk and we'll speak again soon. That's astronomer Fred Watson who joins us every week here on Space Nuts. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thank you for listening. Don't forget to share us on Facebook or uh, whatever platform you're using. And we will catch you next week on Space Nuts. Space Nuts. You've been listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Subscribe to the full podcast on iTunes, Audio Boom, and Stitcher or your favourite podcast distributor. This has been another quality podcast production from Sites.com.